Welcome to the Rideshare Guy podcast, where you will learn about the rideshare and mobility industry straight from Harry Campbell, who's got over five years experience covering the industry and has talked to thousands of drivers. There's no better place to stay up to date, entertained, and educated. So let's dive in. All right, so today's guest is my friend Jonah Bliss. While many of you may know him from past episodes, you might not know that not only is he a transportation expert, having launched everything from Turo to -to direct-to-consumer e-bikes, he's also a bit of food, curbs, and delivery buff. So he really does it all. He's hosted events that featured everyone from Taco Bell CMO Marissa Thalberg to Postmates SVP Eric Edge. And, uh, you know, hopefully uh, Jonah can email Taco Bell CMO about getting rid of that Mexican pizza. I'm not in love with that decision, but uh, we'll talk about that off and this Tuesday and Wednesday, he, I, and a few other friends are actually combining a lot of our shared interests for the curb for a fantastic free event, virtual, of course. We're calling it Curbivore. So whether you're a delivery driver, restaurateur, food techie, or just interested in this space and everything that's happening at the curb, make sure you join us at curbivore.co to register. That's C-U-R-B-I-V-O-R-E dot C-O. How does that sound, Jonah? That sounds great. Honestly, I'm a little bit more of a uh, Crunchwrap Supreme fan, but uh, I, I feel you. You know, any menu loss is a help by all. So uh, my my wife uh, as a birthday present got me some Taco Bell today. So uh, uh, she might be trying to kill me, actually. <laughs> nice. I, I was going to say I'm I'm a big fan of the Crunchwrap Supreme also, and uh, but I think the Mex- Mexican pizza was very nostalgic for me. I used to eat it all the time when I was a little kid. It's been around forever, so I was very disappointed. And uh, my uh, my wife's sister actually works at Taco Bell. At, uh, I think she's a food chef or something there. And she got many texts from other disappointed fans. So I have a feeling it might be making a comeback eventually. It's it's the original <laughs> SoCal fusion food, you know? So it's OG Kogi. So I think starting off talking about Taco Bell is uh, the perfect segue into uh, this conference um, and really all the work and things we've been thinking about lately. Um, I mean, I guess, first of all, what, what is, what, how'd you come up with the name Curbivore? Because uh, that was all you, right? Uh, <laughs> you know, maybe my, my only skill in life is coming up with puns. Okay. Um, but no, I, I mean, I think the name, not to toot my own horn, but it really speaks to what we're working on here, um, which is, yeah, it's it's in this particular delicate moment uh, in the U.S. and the world, dining has really shifted outdoors, right? Yeah. And whether that means that you're honestly eating outside, sitting on a bench on the sidewalk, or you're doing pickup, you're doing delivery, it all involves this really hotly contested curb space, yeah. uh, which in the United States, States especially was already pretty small. We got junky sidewalks left and right. Um, and so even before the pandemic, you know, that sidewalk space was being contested by your birds and your limes and your Ubers and your lifts all fighting for drop off right there. Um, and now, you know, you have restaurants that are also trying to put their, you know, outdoor dining tables there. You have people queuing up to wait and do ghost kitchen pickups yeah. and drop offs. Um, so it's just, it's become like the most contested space. And on one side, like we, we need it to work because we want these businesses, these local institutions to survive and thrive and cities need that sales tax revenue. But we don't also want to privatize what scant public space is left in the US and make it so that if you're in a wheelchair or pushing a stroller, you just, you know, go around. Um, so it's, it's a delicate conversation. Yeah, I think one of the things that's so interesting to me about the curb is that there are literally so many huge constituents, stakeholders, interested parties, whatever you want to call it, that care about access to the curb, whether it's free or paid or for business or personal uses. I mean, you even left out, you know, like UPS, Amazon, and, uh, you know, like those are some of the biggest yeah. guys. And I think just the fact that, you know, th- that it's so easy to forget them in this type of conversation kind of highlights like, wow, there really is, you know, a lot of demand. There are a ton of demands for space and, you know, everything else going on at the curb, right? Yeah, this is maybe the first time I've ever forgotten about Amazon or anything. <laughs> um, but yeah, you got, you got Amazon, you got delivery vans, you got the good old postal service, which uh, RIP, hopefully not. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, this topic is so important because everyone uses the curb, mm-hmm. you know, unless you truly have taken the pandemic to the 
the deepest you know, you're just hiding in your well, closet i guess and if, um, if you are in the closet and everybody though, eats you know but if even if you're someone who you know is staying in, at home in the closet or in your living room i mean you're still ordering food and those people are using the curb and if there isn't good access for them it's going to take longer for you to get your you know hopefully healthier meal in, in times of covid but uh you know so i mean it does kind of indirectly affect everyone i would say or directly affect them yeah no it's, it's like unless you are <laughs> a hermit on your own farm you care about the curb and you care about food. Yeah. How, how do you think it compares to the roadway? Because I think one of the things when you started describing the curb, I was like, well, we also have these things out in the middle of the street, right? That has had a ton of, I mean, we, I don't know that we've really figured out the roads yet either, right? I mean, roads are pretty congested and pretty, you know, kind of semi bad, to terrible experience, especially pre pandemic in a lot of places. Uh, how do you look at the differences and similarities between the curb and, and the roadways? Yeah. Yeah. And I guess, you know, when we're talking about the curb, I feel like we're talking about that uh, intersection <laughs> of, of the sidewalk and the street space. Yeah. Right. And it's so it's it's really about both. Um, and yeah, you're right that pre pandemic, basically every city in the U.S. had terrible congestion and subpar public transit. Um, obviously, there's been a traffic reduction um, because of people working from home. Um, cities in Europe and Asia are really using this occasion to rethink the street. And in a lot of ways, it feels like we've kind of fallen behind in the U.S. Um, we've seen a little bit of nibbling. Some cities have been bolder. You know, Oakland's done a pretty good job. Um, but yeah, like this could be an opportunity to paint thousands of miles of bike lanes and make them protected. This could be an opportunity to convert parking spots into eatlets or streeteries, depending on which term you subscribe yeah. to, uh, which in my opinion is much better than trying to put people on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, cities are being cautious and they're experimenting, um, but I think bolder action is needed. Yeah. So what's one of your favorite ideas, or I guess you would even say experiments that you've seen kind of come out of COVID? Because obviously, you know, you talked about the outdoor dining and the parklets, like those are everywhere, all over LA and many other cities. Um, there's the pickup drop-off zones that I've seen for couriers and I guess just anyone looking to do good do to go food. There's the slow streets on certain streets, which I don't think work very well, um, but are a great idea. <laughs> What's great one, idea. What's one of your favorite, you know, I guess just personal, personally things you've seen? Uh, oof, my favorite thing. You know, or, it's, or more it's, most impactful, I think, would also work. I think what it really is, and, and we're seeing this, you know, very ad hoc and, and some, it's not even, at least in the U.S., no city has done it, but there's like neighborhoods that have done it. So I think, you know, we've seen photos from like Chinatown, Little Italy, having in New York, having done a great job. Or um, in L.A., this is going to be, a deep cut for our SoCal heads, but the the town of Sierra Madre by Pasadena has actually done a great job. And it's what they're doing is they're they're being like holistic about this. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just though we'll throw some tables there and give you an emergency permit here, but it's like converting giant swaths of street space in, into outdoor dining, you know, informal parks almost, um, closing streets down to just or I should say opening streets to just pedestrians. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's, no one wants to just dine on the side of a highway, right. uh, which is what a lot of people are just kind of like doing as the band-aid solution. But if you're really rethinking what it means to use our outdoor space, um, and really making it a public space. So it's not that, okay, uh, this two blocks is given to restaurant a, but it's just, Hey, this is now an open space. You can, you know, kick a soccer ball. You can sit on a picnic bench. And if you happen to get food from a nearby restaurant, make use of it too. Yeah. Um, I, th I think it's a chance to really be a little more community oriented. Yeah, no, and I, I love that answer because I think it gives a lot of insight into the themes and sort of the reasons why you, uh, you know, wanted to start Curbivore. So I guess, I, I guess as an entrepreneur, I'm always curious how people come up with their ideas. So if we step back a little from the actual nuts and bolts discussion at the curb, how, how did you come up with this idea for a conference at the curb and, you know, bring together and, you know, folks like myself and we can talk about some of our other co-organizers and panelists and in a second but uh how did you come up with this idea to actually, yeah. <laughs> do, to actually do the conference i mean that's sometimes i wonder that myself <laughs> um if, if anyone out there is an entrepreneur that's like thinking they're gonna get an amazing business tip I, i've got sad news uh, like, like to me it's it's more about the idea and less about you know a, a business or a business plan mm -hmm. um and hopefully yeah i think that's probably true of lots of ideas that grow into something but this was just something that i think lots of people observe but just you know as someone that's passionate about cities and has friends that both 
either run restaurants or cafes or our sort of service industry workers and seeing how they were affected, seeing how some of them have like honestly made the most of it. I know restaurants near me where it's like they used to have a tiny little indoor dining area. Yeah. And now they've taken over like 10 X the, the street space and they're thriving and they're doing delivery and pickup and you know, making way more money than before. And then there's other people that have folded or mm -hmm. shelled themselves, like, you know, tragic kind of just either their menu wasn't adaptable to it or they just sort of too busy surviving COVID to make the transition. Yeah. Um, so to me, it was just like observing, oh, there's like an emergency going on. Lots of people are sort of talking about this from their own wheelhouses. Um, you know, so if you're a restaurant person, you know, you're talking about restaurants. If you're a city person, you're talking about cities. If you're a transportation person, you're talking about transportation. But there wasn't, there wasn't that nexus, that kind of dialogue between all the parties. Yeah. Uh, and that's why I thought we needed to sort of kick things off with a big free event where we just get everyone in the same virtual room, mm -hmm. uh, you know, bring people like you who are an expert of kind of, you know, Ubers and TNCs, um, our other friends, uh, you know, Luke, and Matt bringing, you know, micromobility, restaurant tech, um, got, got some design background from Tracy. So I don't know. It's, it's not that we've assembled the, the crack team, but I think we've kind of come up with some smart people and we're just trying to make life better for everyone. Yeah, no, I think uh, uh, my my podcast listeners might uh, recognize the, the name Matt Newberg, who's actually been on the podcast before. I want to say actually a couple times we did an episode back about uh, uh, ghost and virtual kitchens. Then he came on a few months ago to talk about app delivery fees and sort of uh, why why those are so uh, damn high. And uh, you know, so I think that there's definitely, I guess, one thing you said that stood out to me is, I mean, literally physically, a lot of these. Um, you know, restaurateurs, retailers, delivery app companies, right? I mean, they're literally like physically meeting at the curb, <laughs> you know, which is pretty interesting, yeah. right? And so I think I think that's kind of for me, I'm always, and just to share a little of my personal um, experience and kind of why I wanted to get involved with this project and w work with you is because like, I'm very interested in the intersection of a lot of, you know, I, I mean, I'm obviously an expert, I guess you would say, quote unquote, in rideshare, and that's what I'm known for. But I think the intersection, it's the yeah, it's on the hat uh, if you're watching the video live right now on YouTube. And uh, the intersection, though, of rideshare and uh, restaurants, for example, right? The intersection of that food delivery uh, side. Like, I don't know anything about, you know, doing a restaurant, but I do know that food delivery is a very important part of restaurants. And now with the pandemic, it's even more important and really like understanding like what it takes to actual actually be a gig worker and delivering food, I think is so important because, you know, there's so many stories and issues about, you know, like, you know, when you're a restaurant and you outsource your delivery to a third party company, you have no idea, no control. And you can imagine that, um, you know, if you don't understand what the motivations are of a gig worker, which is sort of like to get in there and get out as quickly as possible and make as much money as possible and have good parking and, you know, good pickup and drop off and just like understand from that level, like it can actually help you run your business so much better. And, you know, it's not going to solve everything. But I think that's like the perfect example of like that rest. Like I imagine so many restaurateurs out there like have no idea what it's like to actually you know like deliver food for these app companies that might now be 50 percent or more of their business yeah and and we've even seen and then I, I know some states are trying to take action on this but you know some restaurants don't even know which platforms and networks they're on yeah um depending on the network's business model where they'll just sometimes i'll just kind of scrape a list and then they basically just put in the order and send someone pick it up and you know not only could that be frustrating if you're a restaurant tour and you want to control your image and where you show up but it just means that you know a bunch of people are standing outside your door trying to order food and pick it up and you have no idea who they are and they have no idea who you are and yeah. it's just you know that's that's how you end up delivering <laughs> soggy fries to someone that gives you zero stars and then it's like a lose lose for everyone yeah yeah and then leaves a bad yelp review too i'm sure so uh, i think yeah, restaurants are obviously a, a big uh, portion of the conference how do you see sort of the programming uh, being laid out uh, did you, how did you think about it like as far as tracks or segments or what, what do you think yeah i mean there's a little bit of something for everyone but yeah restaurants and retailing um super important i, I think we've gotten an amazing list of people that both either you know run their own restaurants or stores mm -hmm. or platforms that help them do a better job of that. So yeah. we've got, you know, on that ladder, we've got Chris Webb, the CEO of Chow Now, which is sort of a the roll your own solution for restaurants, uh, online ordering delivery. Um, we've got the CEO of Mercado, which uh, is a kind of lets markets and sort of general merchandisers do online shopping. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, we've got people that are actually run their own restaurants and have figured out how to make that transition to delivery, outdoor dining, and even kind of pantry items. Um, Judy Nee, who runs a, a great restaurant in Philadelphia. Um, and then, yeah, for, for everyone else, you know, we've got people talking about yeah, delivery vehicles, whether that's a, yeah. you know, a, a trike with a storage thing on it or a delivery bot. Um, we've got, you know, people from sort of city and architects and planners talk about how do you adapt that street space so it's both pleasant and profitable. Um, I mean, it's a kind of convergence of people that care about food, people that care about cities and people that care about technology. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's a good way to put it. And I think there's definitely, you know, I think the restaurateurs and retailers, that's probably the one segment where there's going to be a few panels and workshop where it's like kind of solely dedicated to them. Um, but I think with some of the other segments like TNCs and uh, micro mobility or even, you know, sort of the food delivery, I think they're, you know, much more, I think some of the content seems to me like much more focused on the intersection, right? Like I think you mentioned a good one, like kind of, I, I know we have this panel that's going to be, uh, these titles are still working. I don't know if they'll actually be this at the panel, but small vehicles for small trips, reshaping delivery for the last mile. I like this one. This one sort of stood out to me and my audience specifically because I think when it comes to food delivery and really, I think, del delivery or logistics of any kind, that last mile right now um, is, or I guess really the, the only mile in sometimes case of food delivery, right? Because you just take food from the restaurant to uh, the customer. I guess that's going to not last mile, but it's the, only mile, it's the only <laughs> mile really. And, yeah. uh, you know, I would say almost all of these trips, you know, 90% are happening in a car. And uh, there's just so many logistical issues that come up. And, you know, I mean, I've even noticed like probably here in L.A., like anecdotally, maybe like 10 to 15 percent of people pre pandemic actually delivered food as a team just because it made so much easier to park, you know, during the busy lunch and dinner hours, um, easier to navigate, easier to drop off food. If you know you're, you're dropping somewhere off where there's no parking like in, you know, like West uh, West Hollywood, for example, right? Like there's literally nowhere to park um, even in the residential areas or like mid-city where those big apartment buildings are so i think it's really interesting this panel because it's sort of all about um basically like getting e-bikes uh you know into couriers hands getting uh basically smaller vehicles as then as a the title might suggest into uh the situations whether it's commercial or you know kind of personal use uh kind of just like making the right vehicle for the right trip right which i think we're we're not really doing a lot of right now yeah, and I, you know, I, I think we can kind of extrapolate that up to like a, a bigger American <laughs> foible, if you will. That yeah. uh, cars cars can be great. I mean, whether you're a gearhead or not, you know, cars they're fantastic for certain uses. But in the U.S., we've basically decided that the car is the tool for every single possible imaginable trip, um, and that's why we have terrible congestion and giant roads and you know high greenhouse gas emissions, um, and by making the car so, you know, kind of top of the pecking order, it almost makes the use cases where a car would be the right thing more unpleasant. So if we can shift some of these other uses to, you know, micro mobility or a cargo bike, you know, things things that our, our friend Luke is passionate yeah. about, um, it's a win-win for everyone. You know, it gets unnecessary trips off the road. It probably is going to get you your food faster. Um, it's better for the environment and uh, your, your food's going to arrive warm. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, you know, to go off script a little bit too, this is not even, I, I know we have both worked a little on this panel and help, but it's not, we're not the owners of this panel, so we can totally preview it and have no repercussions. <laughs> but uh, I'm just going to focus on this because I see that the panelists, I think, are almost all confirmed. Um, Michael Naka, who's actually also been on my podcast before, is going to be moderating. Uh, ben Morris, uh, CEO of Coaster Cycles, which is a really cool company, and they've got a bunch of cool use cases with their bikes and e-bikes. Mina Nada, who hasn't been on the podcast yet, but I, I've chatted with him a lot and I'm sure that we'll be working on some stuff uh, soon. He's the CEO of Zumo and they're doing, they're basically putting uh, e-bikes into couriers' hands. Kelly Rula, who's a new mobility lead up at Seattle DOT and uh, Jeremy Saffron from NYC DOT, which uh, I think is going to be doing some cool stuff with e-bikes and e-scooters and a bunch of legislation there. But I think, um, you know, with, with a panel uh, like this, I think the thing, you know, to go off script a little, like the thing that kind of comes to my mind, though, and totally unrelated to Curbivore, but well, related, but unrelated is, I mean, how do you 
you know, it's like, I, I always hear this refrain, like, oh, we got to shift cars away from trips or, oh, we got to do this and we got to do that. And I feel like a lot is working against <laughs> that vision though. Like even right now in the pandemic, right? Like it's, you know, there's so many rental cars, you know, that have all this abundance. Yep. Like there's basically like cars are actually really cheap right now. You can actually rent them for really cheap. There's like a huge sup oversupply of cars. So it's like, you know, I get that. And even like during COVID, I will say like, you know, some of the issues like, finding parking is now easier. Um, there's less traffic. Yeah. So like, frankly, some of the advantages of some of these, you know, better modes, uh, you know, are, are less pronounced. So, like, how do you kind of balance, how do you think about balancing like what we want people to do with the reality <laughs> of what people are actually going to do? That's uh, the trillion dollar question. Um, but, yeah, well, first, yeah, just kind of playing off your point. Yeah. And I think I saw a stat this morning actually showing that used car prices have actually spiked like 10% because Everyone's rushing to get one. Yeah. Um, you're right that, yeah, especially in the U.S., a lot of these modes, these non-car modes, whether it's transit or, or biking or really anything else, uh, they work during peak hours. You know, that's when the, the subway and the bus comes most frequently. And so if you're trying to take it to your job downtown, hey, that's a reason to avoid the car. But if you're working from home or you're working odd hours now, um, suddenly there's one fewer kind of point in favor of not taking your car. Yeah. Um, yeah, how do we fix that? Oh, that's that's like unwinding a hundred years of uh, industrial policy. Well, it, um, I, I guess I'll answer my own question then, because I think like the way to sometimes fix or start to address that is to like understand the consumer behaviors that are are trending in that direction, right? And then like kind of build off of that, right? So if it's like for right now, like, every, okay, in the past couple of years, everybody loves these little e-scooters. Okay, they're kind of, you know, goofy little scooters that we can ride around. But if you can get people on an e-scooter, then they realize that like, oh, maybe for a little longer trip, I should ride an e-bike or, oh, I should ride like a little pod or, oh, it's actually like pretty nice to, you know, zip in and out of traffic, right? Kind of like get them a little taste of it. And so that's sort of what, you know, I, I feel like um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in. And I don't know if that's really now, if we're still talking about curbivore, but uh, totally off script no <laughs> I, I think I think I think we are and, and you know going back a second ago I think you're right you, you give people a taste and whether they stick to renting it or they decide to buy their own uh, the, you know the next step is then making sure they're actually comfortable using that and that's yeah. yeah the opportunity that we have right now that I wish cities weren't being so timid about is you have in so many cities these giant flabby streets that prioritize car use and basically make it unpleasant to walk or bike or scoot uh, with reduced congestion, you know, maybe maybe we just take one of those car lanes and make it a bike and scooter lane, or maybe we widen the sidewalk. Um, and so, you know, these aren't trillion dollar, you yeah. know, covering your city and subway kind of solutions. These are things that mm -hmm. should be relatively affordable, relatively quick, um, and give people an alternative to just even more congestion when the economy opens back up. Yeah. So is there is there any specific panel or speaker that you're really, you know, I mentioned one that I like, and um, is there any specific panel or speaker, speaker that you're really looking forward to at the conference that you sort of want to make sure people are aware of? Yeah. I, I mean, I'm excited for kind of kicking off day one, Chris Webb, the CEO of Chow Now. Mm -hmm. um, I think for people that haven't been watching this space that interestingly, that closely, Chow Now is interesting because it's, it's sort of, it's almost like the antithesis to the way most of the platforms work. So instead of you joining uh, one of the delivery networks for free and they you know, give you the smartphone and all this stuff, you basically buy into Chow Now and you kind of roll your own mm -hmm. online ordering POS and then eventually delivery fleet. So it gives you as the restaurateur you know, way more control over you know, hours and inventory and pricing and delivery range and all these things that are honestly important to controlling your kind of customer experience what the outcome of that order turns out to be. Um, it lets you so own I, I don't the want, customers. I don't want to yeah, no, it lets you own the yeah, customers right. too, which I think as, you know, I know you've got a marketing background and I, I'm again, I don't know crap about restaurants, but I do know uh, when it comes to marketing, you have to own your customers, right? Whether it's through an email list or through, you know, some direct communication channel. And I think that's the, the issue that a lot of restaurateurs have with some of these app delivery services. And you'll actually even see that when you place an order from a top uh, QSR um, type uh, restaurant, so 
like a, you know like a Starbucks or a Chipotle or, or something like that um, it actually often asks you if they can share their information with Starbucks right because like those big companies have negotiated with Uber Eats for example like okay hey yeah. we want you know this opt-in button so that we can have information about our customers whereas you know a lot of the smaller to medium size uh, retailers don't have that bargaining capability right so it's sort of like I think uh, it is um, interesting to like kind of understand like what you know your options are out there with a, with a chow now for example and kind of like balance that like you know I think there's there's a lot of positives to all of these services and products and technologies and you know everything that we're going to be highlighting at the conference but it may not work perfectly for every restaurant in every situation and so it's sort of like I think a lot of what I like about this is we're kind of like enlightening people as to what the options are like chow now probably isn't perfect for everyone but I bet there's a bunch of people who don't even really know what it is or you know that it existed or like how they might be able to leverage it I mean because even you know like with Chow now for example I believe you can even still use DoorDash's API and Postmates's API and just pay them 15% and do delivery you know through them so you can literally just like own a percentage of your customers and still not have to worry about a delivery fleet um, and so like that's like a simple example of you know how you can kind of leverage uh, the best of both worlds. Yeah. No, and to that point, I mean, part of what's so important to me about this topic and, and what, you know, why I thought, hey, we need to do this. Um, this is for the little guys, you know, the small businesses, mm -hmm. local restaurants, retailers, the mom and pop shop that you know and love down the street, the sushi place that you go to once a month. Um, and, and to me, that's really like the, the heart and soul of so many of our cities. And that's what makes them interesting is local cuisine and, you know, cool little indie shops. Um, yeah, obviously, you know, the word retail apocalypse kind of gets thrown around a lot and yeah, it's, it's really sad if a large chain goes out of business because that's, you know, lots of thousands mm, of yeah. employees and people shop there. But I think at the end of the day, that the thing that people are more, um, attuned to, it's like, you know, when you see the shop that you walk past every day, go out of business and you're like, Oh, I knew the owner and I was friendly with the wait staff. That's like the real kind of gut punch. Um, that's who. I think it's important to really keep alive, keep that local flavor, help them make sure they have the knowledge of, of you know, how to make this transition work. Um, I mean, yeah, it, it'll be sad if all the kind of Lord and Taylors and Chili's of the world go out of business too, but I, I'd be sadder if just the sushi saw it down the place folds Yeah, personally. You know, I, I totally resonate with that because uh, well, my, my go-to pho vermicelli, not pho, a vermicelli place so where i get my vermicelli uh actually closed down recently or you know during the pandemic so that was very unfortunate so i'm still looking for a new place but i think it kind of just highlights the fact that you know i think with a lot of these restaurant restaurants and retailers i think that uh, you know they're, they're sort of a good they're kind of like the you know the the underdog that everyone likes to root for and so i think part of what this conference is about is definitely helping them and kind of you know uh, sh sharing the the technological solutions i guess too that could help uh, a lot of their business right and kind of mixing uh, that intersection of restaurateurs and retailers and tech and startups and government and city tech right yeah yeah. Yeah. It's all there. Very cool. Well, uh, I think I got a pretty good overview of the conference and uh, I'm uh, deeply immersed in it. So I feel like uh, I know everything that's going on. <laughs> but uh, did, did I miss anything? Is there anything else you want to add? And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll definitely we can share logistics uh, in a second. But any anything else at a high level yeah. you want to share? No, I, I mean, I just think, you know, for, for people listening, the question of why should I care? Um, yeah, we already touched on that. Everybody eats and everybody uses the street. Yeah. Um, but no, whether you're someone that's, you know, a delivery worker or interested in being a delivery worker, or you work in technology, or yep. you just happen to own a business or a restaurant, I mean, we're trying to speak to everyone. We're trying to get them all in the same room and converse. So you know, our programming is not just a bunch of C-suite execs sort of spouting their vision statements, but where, yeah, we have delivery workers, we have people that run small businesses. Um, so it's really about you know, fostering that dialogue. How do we keep these businesses, these workers, you know, happy and healthy. How do we, you know, keep marginalized communities from being kind of further segregated? It's it's all there, and it's it's important. Yeah, very cool. Well, uh, I appreciate uh, all the work. I know you've been uh, put, putting some time into organizing this, and I've been trying to do my do my part when I'm not uh, busy camping. But uh, appreciate <laughs> everything. So, if people are interested in Curbivore, uh, where should they go? What should they do? What should they know? And uh, how do they find out more? I think what they should do is uh, www.curbivore, C-U-R-B-I-V-O-R-E.co, okay. not .com, but .co. 
Um, and then, yeah, it's it's free to join. It's Tuesday and Wednesday, the, the 20th and 21st, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Very cool. I'm on the website right now. I don't think I've actually registered myself, so I should probably register since I'm helping organize. And uh, yeah, I know on there we've got a conference overview so you can sort of learn about the themes. Um, I think the speakers page we've been updating pretty frequently. So by the time this comes out, we'll have a nice long list of uh, speakers that are all on there. And then also, uh, you know, kind of program in information so you can kind of see to get a sneak peek at uh, what um, you know panels and workshops and keynotes we've got a couple cool ones that we're finalizing right now that I'm not going to jinx and announce right now but I think are looking <laughs> pretty positive and then you can register there too and I'm sure I'll be on there speaking at least on a panel or two or moderating so if you guys uh, are listening to this podcast right now you probably enjoy hearing my thoughts or my voice or it puts you to sleep some nights and uh, well, you, you can get a little more of that uh, during the conference. Sound good, Jonah? That's, it's those dulcet tones we know and love. <laughs> yeah. And then I guess the only other thing too is, you know, if someone's listening to this uh, or watching this, uh, this podcast that we're doing right now after the conference takes place, will they have access to it? Uh, recorded sessions or how does that all work? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there'll be recorded sessions. Um, still, even if you can't make the dates worth signing up and you know, get the notifications, see what yeah. you missed, watch the replays. Um, it's, it's, uh, something for everyone. Yeah. And it is free, right? It's very free. <laughs> Yeah, so we're not we're not uh, I think uh, focused on revenue this year, but I think if it does uh, go all, all go well, you know, hopefully we can do it bigger and better uh, in the future. Yeah, that that would be fun. All right, Jonah, sounds good. Well, I appreciate it, and uh, I'm very much looking forward to uh, participating and attending uh, these sessions uh, very soon. Cool. Thank you, Harry. Take care. <laughs>